Hello, welcome to the presentation on testing precision timing protocol clocks uh, in the lab prior to deployment. This could be interesting if you're building a design of a switch or router or a network interface card that incorporates the 1588 precision timing protocol or PTP. The presentation will cover uh, some aspects of how you would specify uh, performance limits for your design and how you would go about testing it. So what are you actually measuring when you're measuring the performance of a clock? Well, the answer is really time error. Um, when you're transferring time using network or network equipment, we're measuring the error uh, in that time that you transfer, and it's called time error. It's also sometimes referred to as noise, so that's noise of the clock uh, in terms of transferring time. So time error is very simply when you have a reference clock or a master clock, uh, what is the error of the time that's recovered relative to that? So for example, if you have a measured clock that's uh, five minutes behind, uh, you would have a time error of minus five minutes. And so neg that would be a negative time error. Uh, and again, if the, if the clock wasn't advanced from the actual reference clock, uh, in this case by five minutes, you would have a five minutes or plus five minutes uh, time error. Now this is an illustration, really these devices and networks, we're looking at measuring uh, and performing time errors in the, in the order of uh, single digit or tens of nanoseconds. And we'll come on to some of those uh, requirements in the, later in the presentation. So you're measuring the performance of clock based on time error. Why, what causes time error? Well, when you have a design of either a piece of equipment uh, in the network or the network itself, uh, every aspect of that generates an error in time. This is because you've got a master clock generating time and a slave clock recovering time and the network transmitting those packets, the PTP packets, uh, to transfer the time. So there is um, obviously the protocol stack in the master and slave clock can add a variable delay and in to the time. Uh, but of course, some of that can be mitigated by having hardware time stamping in the master and clock. Then the network itself, the, the process of queuing uh, and transmitting and also recovering and regenerating the clock adds errors. So time error in PTP is fundamentally caused by uh, things like um, errors in, in time uh, of the equipment, um, changes in behavior of the packets in the network, and things like uh, asymmetry and, and differences in latency. So all of these variable uh, factors in, in the equipment and the network causes time error, and what we're trying to do is measure the time error and keep it within limits. So what are the limits that we need to measure to? Well, that really depends on the application. So let's look at a data center, for example. If we're dis using PTP to distribute timing in a data center, you might have either a national time service or GPS coming into a master clock, and then the network in the data center itself are distributing that time. So the spine and leaf switches here are act as what we call boundary clocks to transfer the and recover and transfer the time. Then on the server racks themselves, the network interface cards would be a PTP slave to recover the time using PTP. So Commonly, we've heard the requirements of sometimes tens of milliseconds in certain applications, but also in the more stringent applications, uh, we've heard requirements in, of uh, one microsecond, so plus or minus one microseconds maximum error uh, between the grandmaster and the network interface card, for example. So this really depends on what is the application, what is the requirement that you need. We'll come on to why this one microsecond number makes a difference uh, later on. Because if you're designing equipment to go into that network, when you build that network, it has to meet that one microsecond number. A more defined uh, limit for um, application of PTP is really in mobile networks. So mobile networks uh, have a requirement, particularly time domain networks, of a maximum uh, time error of plus or minus 1.5 microseconds uh, in the radio signal over the air. Why? Because really the, the actual requirement, fundamental requirement, is for adjacent base stations to have a maximum time error of three microseconds. So in order for that to be maintained, we, we say that a single um, base station should have a maximum time error of plus or minus 1.5 microseconds. So this number is useful because we now know that end to end from this master clock to uh, where the time is recovered and used, we have a maximum error of 1.5 microseconds. We can then use that to build in budgets for each of the building blocks of this network. And the way we do that really is, again, we start with that end-to-end -end budget of 1.5 microseconds, plus or minus 1.5 microseconds. 
we allocate some of that budget um, to the, the endpoints of the network. So the network itself, which is delivering the synchronization, is left with a 1.1 microsecond budget. And then again, we take a little bit of that budget, we allocate it to the Grandmaster clock itself, uh, in this case 100 nanoseconds. Uh, then we uh, include elements for random variations, asymmetry, uh, and so on, in terms of holdover and the end application requirements, and we allocate these budgets. So this example here comes from a body called the ITUT, the International Telecoms Union for Telecoms. And, and that they have a, a recommendation, G.8271.1, which starts with that end-to-end -end budget and then allocates, depending on, on the, the uh, equipment or the application, budgets for each equipment. So you have a, a method of deployment using what we call class A devices, and that's really a network that's built of up to 11 nodes, and those 11 nodes have a total uh, time error limit of 550 nanoseconds, which fundamentally means each node has a 50 nanosecond uh, time error limit. So again, by building a, an end-to-end, -end, or starting with an end-to-end -end time error requirement, and then allocating bits of that budget to different parts of the, of the network, you can then know if you are building a switch that goes into a network and there will be 11 nodes uh, or 11 hops of that switch, then the individual switch has a limit of 50 nanoseconds. And again, uh, it really depends on the end application. This is the telecoms deployment and model for mobile networks predominantly. The data center world uh, would have different requirements. One point I will make though is that increasingly telecoms and mobile networks specifically the infrastructure will be data centers. And so the, 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 um, the numbers that you see here will very quickly work their way into uh, the data center world. So for example, today a, a telecoms router, telecoms grade router would have a time error limit of 50 or 20 nanoseconds. In the future, a data center top of rack switch would have similar limits as well. Uh, so if you're designing equipment like that, uh, those are the numbers to bear in mind. So that's the actual limits. And in fact, in the telecoms world, uh, depending on what device you're making, whether it's the grandmaster at the start of, the, of that sh synchronization chain, a slave at the end of that link, or things like boundary clocks and transparent clocks, BCs and TCs, there are standards in place to uh, specify what is the performance limits of those devices. So we know what the limits are going to be. What are the measurements that we make? The first thing to look at is really to set up a test setup. So we have a device under test, and we wrap that device around with a reference clock, an emulated master, and an emulated slave. And by doing this, by locking the whole reference, uh, measurement and uh, reference to single time base, uh, we can then measure the error of the device under test itself. So first of all, the master and slave are synchronized, then the master provides a time or, and or a frequency reference to the device under test. Uh, we may uh, it may be one PPS so at time of day, and then we can also add network impairments. Now, very importantly, the frequency um, synchronization element can be impacted by network impairments like jitter, and so we can we should be uh, adding some of those impairments when we're making a test. Then we measure the um, the the output of the device under test using the emulated slave, and by doing this, we're actually able to measure what we've called the time error of the device under test. And these impairments, of course, are really to add real-world test conditions uh, to, that, to that test. So the test setup is really we emulate um, all of the, uh, the network components around the device under test, we send a reference time, and we measure the recovered time from the device under test. And we have three uh, concepts of the error itself, with the actual generation or noise generation or time error generation, which is really we supply an ideal input and measure the output. We also test the tolerance to input noise or input time error. And then finally, we test the transfer of a device, uh, the noise coming in and what's the output of that noise. So again, uh, recommendations exist for, for all of these different test setups. Uh, and we use a piece of test equipment to measure the time error of a device. So what are the limits we're measuring to? Um, well, we looked at the example of data center and a mobile network. So remember, earlier we had said that if a data center has an end-to-end -end requirement of microsecond, it really depends how many nodes and uh, links are in that uh, hop between the master and the slave, and also what are the budgets that you allocate to the master and the slave itself. So we would imagine that in a data center world uh, for, for normal operations, 
each node of a, of a top of rack or a spinal leaf switch should be performing to limits within 50 or 250, 250 nanoseconds. And that is the, you remember, the test setup that we had before. We make the measurement and we want the time error of your design to be within 50 to 250 nanoseconds. In a telecoms application, remember we started with 50, 50 nanoseconds per node, or the class B uh, more stringent requirement, which is 20 nanoseconds per node. In fact, now there are class C and class D equipment also being specified with limits down to as low as 5 or 10 nanoseconds. So in the telecoms world today, if you're designing a router or a switch to go in there, you're looking at an individual switch uh, or device being within 50, 5 to 50 nanoseconds time error total. And, and so really, and we also made the point that the telecoms or mobile infrastructure is migrating rapidly into a data center world. And so very soon, the data center switches will also have to meet these stringent requirements of between 5 and 50 nanoseconds of time error. So we look today at PTP, the concept of time error, which is really the uh, performance measurement of a PTP clock in a, in a network equipment. Uh, we then talked about what are the measurements you need to make, what is time error, what measurements do you make. And then we looked at how limits are specified. We start with the end-to-end -end network requirement. We then look at how many building blocks are used in that end-to-end -end network. And then we allocate budgets for each of the building blocks. So if you're designing a switch or a router, which is a building block for that network, uh, these are some of the limits you'd be looking at between 5 to 250 nanoseconds of time error as the measurement limit. There's a lot more information available at uh, our website, calnexol.com. So I'd encourage you to go in and download that information and review the, uh, the, the information that's there. We hope to find the presentation useful today and we look forward to speaking to you again soon.